Welcome to the Land of Oz podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kelly Krieg, alongside Dr. Carl Boffman. Hello. Hello, Carl. How have you been? Good. Even though no time has passed for people listening to this, so it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, you're an Ohio State fan. They're, they're doing well in the polls, I see. So far. Yeah. Who knows? People are going to be listening to this podcast 10 years from now and be like, what's uh, Ohio State? Yeah. It's like Miami of Ohio. Miami of Ohio? They're... <laughs> All right. Well, we wanted to uh, welcome you back to to our podcast here, and, and we wanted to take up where we left off after our first episode, kind of looking at those um, non negotiables, non negotiables that, as we said, and we left off last time looking at at the non negotiables about uh, the Trinitarian heresies, about what they were, um, and how the church responded to those. And so today, I think one of the things we want to look at is the natures of Christ, the two natures of Christ, and what are some of the heresies that, that developed out of this, and why it is so important that we get the two natures of Christ right, um, and why does it actually matter? Um, so if we want to kind of dive into this a little bit, uh, when, we, when we talk about the two natures of Christ, um, what do we mean, Carl? <clears throat> Well, I think that, well, I also want to kind of preface with, um, you know, sort of connecting to why this might be important. So we talked about last time with the Trinity, and I think as Christians, it's easy to sort of say, oh, you know, I believe, you know, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I believe Jesus, you know, came to earth and uh, became man and uh, lived and died, rose again, and will return. Um, But I think that as we grow in our faith, you know, we have questions we want to understand a little bit more about what all this stuff means and that's when as christianity continues to grow that's when they start asking questions like what does it mean that jesus was you know god took taking on flesh you know how do we explain that in human terms and you know doing that wrong creates a creature that is not (laughs) who jesus was and so when we look at the natures of christ we're looking at how do we talk about this person who is God, because that's what scripture says, and at the same time who has actual human flesh and who dies on a cross and then is dead for three days and then rises again and comes back to life and then ascends into heaven and then says he's going to come back. How do we, how do we explain that humanness sort of aspect? And so when we look at two natures, we're looking at this divine nature of Christ. How do we talk about him as God? And then this human nature, how do we talk about Jesus as uh, a human being uh, who lived, ate, cried, died, laughed, all the kind of stuff we do. Right, exactly. And so when we we talk about the two natures of Christ, we talk about him being 100% God and at the same time 100% man. Uh, How is that possible? And as we go through this episode, we'll kind of see what some of the uh, explanations that veered off uh, the rails, you know, what they said, how they tried to to explain this mystery. Um, and so I think that's similar to what we talked about in the Trinitarian heresies is so oftentimes we try to understand it at a human level. Uh, we try to understand the divine at a human level, and that's just not possible. Um, yeah. And so uh, we have to, you know, to the best of our ability and, and to... Uh, the full extent of which God has has revealed Himself to us, uh, we need to understand. Uh, but but stop there. Um, we need to to not go further and beyond that. Um, so um, when we talk about the unity of the persons, the the communication of the attributes of Christ and of His divinity and His human nature, um, you know, there's a couple of uh, the heresies that we're going to talk about. Uh, one says that, well, God, Christ was simply God. He was not human, um, that there was not a human element to him, or that it, he assumed, the God the God had assumed a flesh of a human and then left that flesh um, at, at the death, or prior to his death. Um, <clears throat> then we'll have the reaction on the opposite side that says, no, well, um, he's not God, actually, he's just human. And so we have to kind of balance those and see, well, what, what does Scripture actually say? What, is, what does the Bible actually say about this? Well, and I think, uh, I think it's important, too, to think about that 
when we look at sort of these arguments that emerge in, you know, third, fourth, fifth centuries, um, these aren't, you know, necessarily just philosophical arguments, but in many ways it is wrestling with, which is sort of the subject of this whole podcast series, wrestling with where culture and Christianity sort of come together. Because this idea of having a being that was God and yet with human flesh is not something that culturally a uh, Greek thinking people would approve of. They wouldn't, you know, they saw a distinct difference between the spiritual and the physical. And for that to be combined just doesn't make any sense to them. In many ways, it was contrary to their science and to their cultural beliefs. Well, yeah, exactly. And we'll see one of the early, earliest uh, heresies that, that comes out of this, this two natures of Christ is the Docetist. Um, and which are very, very uh, heavily reliant upon Gnosticism um, and the idea that the, the flesh is, is corrupted and evil and, and is therefore um, this, this Greek mindset that, you know, the gods aren't going to be in this uh, type of uh, uh, flawed uh, body, I guess. Um, this, so they, would, they would, um, would go away from that. that so they, he wouldn't assume a weakened position if he was truly and fully 100% God. What I mean, and even Paul recognizes, you know, just culturally how ludicrous it sounds. <laughs> because, I mean, he says, you know, that, you know, Christ being both God and man was, you know, a stumbling block to the Jews, but foolishness to the Greeks. Like, that's just ridiculous. And I think um, as modern Christians, um, I think talking about these historical arguments is important because it reminds us that our own Christianity uh, you know, clashes with our culture sometimes and we have to wrestle with, you know, how do we explain Christianity to a culture that doesn't acknowledge things as a possibility? Exactly. And and especially in the modern day, we, we've we gone to this, this rational, a rationalism um, and a scientific uh, explanation for everything. And so... Uh, there is no room for the spiritual. There is no room for uh, for the things of the divine, um, and and that's what has been the controlling narrative for so long, or, or for recently, in 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 our thinking. And now we're starting to see a backlash. But like we see with the even you know we'll look at the the ex, uh, trying these heresies that come up with the, the two natures. That we're seeing a backlash, but we're it's going too far. And so we're seeing a, a mysticism, a reemergence of mysticism and Gnosticism coming back in into our society and denying um, you know uh, the flesh uh, once again. Yeah, I mean, and you know, a couple hundred years ago, you'd had people you know immediately post enlightenment who were not willing to believe anything that they thought could not be, you know, rationally explained with scientific means. And now you have people who say, I don't care if you can explain it with anything. <laughs> so it's just, it doesn't kinda, matter. Right? So we got both sides. <laughs> and I think as Christians, you know, we have to be prepared to engage with that because, you know, as Christians too, I mean, a lot of the stuff we believe is pretty inexplicable and, you know, try explaining the Trinity. We, we use human words to do so, but it's still pretty. Yeah, I mean, we incomplete. We're we're trying to to vocalize a, a mis mystery, a divine mystery, and we, we simply can't do that uh, fully anyway. Um, only to the extent that, like I said, God has revealed Himself to us, we can do that. Uh, everything else uh, takes us into the weeds, takes us off that the narrow path uh, of, of following Christ, and so. Uh, well, one of the, the first uh, heresies we'll, we'll kind of look at uh, that kind of kicks all this off is the Nestorian uh, heresy, uh, so Nestorianism. Um, and so this is a, a bishop in Constantinople, uh, Nestorius, in, in, four, in the 5th century, four, 420s, uh, 430s. He's there, and, and his whole idea is this... Um, his disagreement with the word theotokos um, and uh, the, the Greek, which means basically uh, from theos or God and, and tokos, which uh, translates basically childbearer or, or what it might be. Um, so you have this idea that, that people were calling Mary 
the mother of God or, or the one who bore God. And Nestorius says, no, no that, that you can't rightly call Mary uh, Theotokos. Uh, she can't have born God. She, could, she cannot have done that because God can't be one born. Um, he, he can't be created in that sense. And he can't be confined. An infinite God can't be confined into a finite uh, package inside of Mary. Yeah, and I think like, you know, and when we look at this from Nestorius' perspective, you know, it's understandable that he is nervous about people, you know, misusing who Mary was, um, you know, and misunderstanding what, like, who God is. And so there's certainly that aspect where um, perhaps Nestorius is trying to prevent what could become, you know, a heresy with, you know, what is Mary's role in this? And, you know, how do we talk about God when we use human terms? But I mean, he obviously then creates a heresy himself by, by going a little bit too far. But I mean, we would uh, never misuse Mary in any way, would we? <laughs> Church has never done that. I don't. <laughs> Oh, and I mean, and I think that that's one of the things with uh, Christianity is, you know, we have so many things that without properly remaining in scripture and educating your, uh, and being educated yourself and through church and as part of this Christian community, it's really easy to sort of mess things up because, you know, as sinful humans, we uh, typically do that <laughs> yeah exactly it's and so nestorius's argument is that, that these two natures of christ the divine and the human uh, they are they are separated uh, there is no communication of attributes the, the divine is completely divine and into itself the human uh, completely uh, separated from the divine and so there's no sharing of these characteristics between the divine and the human nature and, and so almost kind of like the person of jesus on earth is essentially two separate people existing in one body almost right well and and we see that that he basically say it says that that mary's son is adopted as the son of god and and so that there's this 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 idea of that um with this complete separation of the divine and the human uh attributes and and so uh, and people say okay well so what? Why do we have to go into the weeds of all of this? What does this, what does this matter? Um, so what if he, they are separated or not, or it, it does some, something? Um, and so, you know, when we look at that, it, it, it helps us. One, one of the reasons we do this is because our understanding, our sacramental understanding of, of the Lord's Supper, um, of who Christ is and how he comes to us. Uh, when we when we separate the two, when we uh, say, well, God's only over here and uh, his human nature is only over there, then, you know, and especially in our Lutheran understanding, what was a biblical understanding of the Lord's Supper, which says that no God in flesh is there in, with, and under the bread and wine. If that's, if that's not the case, if the divine and the human are, are separated, then he can't be there. Um, and then therefore this this blessing that God gives us in the sacrament of the altar becomes a hollow ritual. It becomes uh, something that really can't offer anything, uh, any assurance of, of forgiveness, any, anything other than an than empty, powerless kind of, of meal that we, we share as a kind of a remembrance uh, of, of, of what Christ did on the cross so long ago. Well, and I think that, too... Um we have scriptural evidence that talks about God um, and particularly in the person of Jesus Christ at, in a particular way. And if we ignore that because it makes us uncomfortable or because it makes us have to think too much, um, well, I think we've got bigger problems. <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, the church had scriptures. They had Paul writing in Colossians about the fullness of God dwelling within him and, you know, being the firstborn of creation and all of this sort of phraseology that when you're not, you know, you could easily make somebody stumble over how we're supposed to talk about God. And so that's why, I, you know, that's why God has given us a church uh, as in, you know, a collection of 
believers um, who are educated and who are immersed in scripture and we support each other. And within that, we've got these leaders who we call pastors and bishops. And um, we are led in this church by the Holy Spirit so that we can, you know, look at how scripture is written and, and what it says to us and better articulate our faith and strengthen it through that articulation. Um, but, and I think that what we're going to get to in just a second is one of the ways the church wrestled with these things was by bringing together these uh, leaders of the church in councils. And in these councils, they were able to, through prayer and through study and through discussion, ensure that, you know, they were properly interpreting what God had given us through his word. Um, we've talked, we talked about Nicaea last time with, um, uh, Arius, Arius and, and the Trinity. Um, but of course we also have the council of Jerusalem in scripture itself in the book of Acts, which is sort of this example in scripture that says, Hey, this is a way that you can handle big questions. And so for this two natures, we're going to get two councils. We've got one at Ephesus and 431, which is going to deal mostly with that Theotokos. Um, and in many ways, they dealt exclusively with Theotokos and ended up leaving a lot of questions unanswered, which is why we get another council only 20 years later uh, at Chalcedon. Uh, and that's going to complete our doctrine of Christology, this um, best way we can talk about these two natures of Christ and you know, and who Jesus is as true God and true man. You're listening to In the Land of Us with Reverend Kelly Craig and Dr. Carl Boffman. For over 75 years, our Savior Lutheran Church has taught that among God's people, learning is drawn from the clear truth of God's eternal word, the Bible. Our focus is on the cross where our Savior Jesus Christ died so that we might live with him here and in eternity. As a confessional Lutheran church, our Savior is a liturgical church where the basic pattern of our worship is drawn from the services which have been used by Christians for many centuries all across the world. The components of the liturgy come from the Bible and serve to focus our worship on the Word of God and our response to it in faith. The forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation won for us on the cross by Jesus are delivered to us by the Holy Spirit through the means of grace. God's words of forgiveness, which we hear spoken through His Holy Word, including preaching and holy absolution, and in the sacraments of holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. We invite you to join us for worship every Sunday at 9.30 and on Wednesday evenings during the Advent and Lenten seasons. We are located at 5000 West Tidwell in Houston, Texas, where you can watch us on our Facebook page at facebook.com backslash Our Savior Lutheran Church. If you would like more information, please call us at 713-290-9087 or send us an email at church at osl.cc and find us on our website at osl.cc. God's richest blessings. Nestorius comes, he's teaching that the, the divine and the, and the human natures are completely separated, no, uh, uh, you know, communication of attributes, no, uh, you know, the divine is divine, the, the, the human is the human. And, and so uh, we have Cyril of Alexandria, uh, the bishop there, uh, is refuting uh, Nestorius. And, and so they have this dialogue that is going uh, back and forth. Until finally, there's they say, well, we need we need a council. We need to come together. The church decides this is getting out of hand. Uh, there is too there's too much confusion uh, amongst uh, us, you know the, those of the followers of Nestorius and what he is saying and what the, what the scripture is saying. Um, and so we need to come together to refute this or you know to get something hammered out. Not because, you know, in, in a way of, well, we just need to come to agreement on something, whatever it is, and that's, that'll be fine. We'll just go with that. Um, and, and not really like, well, you know, Storius, bring your best argument. Maybe we'll go with you. Um, but it is, we need to hammer out why you're wrong um, and, and, you know, where, where you're wrong. And we need to articulate better for the people and for the church to be able to understand uh the two natures of Christ. And so, of course, in Ephesus in 341, uh, they come together for that very reason um, and, and ultimately condemn Nestorius um, for, for, being a, for being a heretic um, and, and set in, in place there, which will, two decades later, we're going to see get eventually resolved because we're going to see Eutychius, who really 
goes to the extreme to defend and to speak against Nestorius goes too far. Uh, and they're like, ah, we've got another council to do. Um, and so they have to come back in, in, in Chalcedon and, and kind of correct the overcorrection uh, in, in, that, in that way um, at, at that council. And, and so, you know, we, we look at this and, and we say, okay, well, great, that happened, you know, in the fifth century. We don't have Nestorian anymore. Well, why do we care about this? Well, we do have Nestorian. Yeah. <laughs> there, we have modern day Nestorians, uh, actually, uh, that, that completely agree with it. But then we have, even in the Protestant churches, um, most notably, you know, those that, that uh, follow the Swiss theologian Ulrich Zwingli, um, they, they come from the, the Reformed uh, background. So the, the Zwinglians, the Calvinists, still to a, an extent, have this Nestorius, Nestorian view, especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Um, and that's what kind of define. now they will say, no, we don't. But, <laughs> but ultimately, when you get down to it, that's what they're claiming, that, that, that they, they can't, that the divine and, and the human natures can't be commingled um, together. So, and I think that, like, that's an example of where when we think about, you know, oh, why do we need to, you know, think about these nitty gritty sort of theological things? Um, it's because theology is intertwined with everything that we do. I mean, for example, when you're looking at two natures of Christ, you're also connecting it to issues about sacrament of, you know, Lord's Supper. When you're looking at Trinity, you're, you're, you're thinking about things that deal with, you know, monotheism and uh, baptism and and so forth like that when and even when we think about you know discussions which you know we're not going to do today but when christians get in discussions about things like evolution and darwinian evolution well that connects to ideas of creation why is creation important well creation is important because it's about what do you believe about god what do you believe about scripture and so when you think about an individual topic Oftentimes that topic is so intertwined with so many different theologies and understandings about who God is and who we are and who what creation is that, you know, you start picking those out and tossing them aside. And you're going to unravel the whole thing. And what you've got left is noth nothing that looks like Christianity. Um, and so it's important for us to make sure that when we think about some of these topics, that we're correct <laughs> and that we're that it's in line with what God has revealed to us. And for some things, you know, uh, we also have to acknowledge that some things we might have to say, yeah, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to need to look at more into that or I'm going to need to talk to somebody or maybe God has not revealed enough to us about this topic, which, you know, if that's the case, it usually doesn't weigh incredibly heavy on salvation because God has revealed what is necessary for salvation to us. But yeah, ex exactly. And, and so uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the, how when we don't come to a, an agreement or when we forget about the agreements we had because, oh, well, that was so long ago, uh, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, we get to things like, uh, like I say, the, you know, the, the reformed position on on the Lord's Supper. Now, they're going to re the reform. Well, in, in fact, Calvin uh, or Zwingli. Uh, accuse Luther uh, of of being a Eutychian um, because we were accusing because Luther was basically saying you're 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 an historian you're, yeah. you're 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 dividing these and and so you know to, to you know clarify the reformed position on, on communion uh, you know is is that you know Calvin says the the, the f infinite is the finite is not capable of the infinite um, therefore in the attributes, the divine attributes of Christ in his humanity, his humanity is confined in heaven. Um, and so uh, they believe in a real presence, but only a spiritual real presence. So when, when you take communion, you're, you're partaking only in a spiritual uh, presence because in God, in Christ's divinity, he's omnipresent. He can be anywhere, but in his, in his, uh, his humanity, he's, relocated to this actual right hand of God in heaven. And, it, and every time I 
hear that, it just I, I have this picture of like Jesus like sitting at the throne, like, Dad, Dad, can I, can I go back in? Is, is it time to go? And he's like, No, son, sit, sit. Well, and all the Reformation <laughs> cart, the Lutheran Reformation cart, like cartoons against uh, the Calvinists and, and Zwinglians would oftentimes show Jesus kind of chained to his throne in heaven so that he couldn't leave it. Well, and and, uh, and that's what, and that's what happens because what, what the Calvinists eventually create is this incorporeal phantom of a deity that is incapable of of doing what he says he's doing when he says this is my body um they have to say well not really um just spiritually uh, and, and so uh, you know that's that robs the participant of of the truth of, of Christ's word and, and the promises associated with it. Um, and so, so, you know, so when the Reformed do this uh, and, and deny the true presence, uh, you know, the, the, the corporal presence there the, in his human form, uh, they deny what Christ's words actually say. Well, and um, I think it's important, you know, just to sort of backtrack, when, you know, you've got... Luther and, and his ilk, you know, ilk calling, uh, <laughs> call, call, are you a crypto <laughs> calling, calling Calvinists, you know, Nestorians. And yeah. then you've got Calvin yeah. and his ilk calling, uh, Lutherans, you know, uh, Eutychians. The reason those words are, are so insulting is because, you know, both sides believe that, you know, that the councils, you know, Ephesus and Council are correct, that Jesus has two natures, that he is true God and true man. Like they believe those things because, you know, you know, and even as modern day Christians, you know, if you're a Baptist or Lutheran or, you know, Reformed or Presbyterian or Catholic or whatever, you also believe these things even if you didn't know yeah, what I mean, these councils were and you might not even have ever heard of them before. Yeah. Heard of, or you, yeah. You might not have studied them at all, but you know, in your personal confession of faith and in your, you know, beliefs about who Jesus is, you believe what these councils have affirmed uh, because the councils don't create these doctrines. They merely mm-hmm. affirm what scripture had already been, had already said. And so, you know, for these educated guys writing back and forth to each other, uh, being called essentially heretics <laughs> is, uh, you know, damaging to their pride. And they, of course, want to defend themselves uh, because they believe these things, even if, you know, um, the same things as we do, even though if you, you might not be so familiar with all of these individual councils and so so forth. Exactly. And so, you know, we, we look at, at at what this council does, what they say, um, condemning Nestorius uh Affirming, and like I say, and that was an important part. You, uh, point you made, Carl, was th- this isn't just, uh, and this is what you'll see some churches say. Well, I, they, they don't care about uh, studying this theology. Well, we these are just man-made, uh, you know, doctrines. These are things that man has come up with. Well, and we've we've made these rules, and but it's no, this is just a reaffirming what what Scripture says. Uh, yeah, these, the, these aren't. Uh, you know, people coming up, making stuff out of whole cloth and, and, and just saying, well, wouldn't it be neat if this was the way it was? Or this is what I think it is, so we'll just make a doctrine on this. Yeah, and like, and as, you know, as human beings, we we take things that we learn in Scripture and then we we group them together, you know, about a similar topic and then we call it a doctrine, like the doctrine of the Trinity, doctrine of Christology, um, stuff like that, doctrine of vocation, whatever. But, and we do that, not because we've invented these concepts, but rather we've tried to organize them in a way so that it's easier to explain them, easier to recognize what Scripture has said about these topics. Because, you know, Scripture is not organized topically. No. Um, it's not organized, you know, chronologically either. And so for some people, it's a little overwhelming to sort of figure out, you know, if they want to have a better understanding of a particular topic, it, it might seem overwhelming to try to look up all these things. And so as a church... Um, using, you know, our God-given brains and, you know, talents, we have taken what God has given us and we've organized it in a way that makes it easier to explain what we believe and to teach, uh, uh, you know, the next generation what we believe. Exactly. And so, and so what comes out ultimately of Ephesus in this council is, is the, the uh, confirmation of the uh, communication of attributes, um, this is the unity of the persons of of the 
the divine and, and the human nature of Christ, that, uh, which in other words, uh, the hypostatic union uh, of, of, of the divinity and, and, the, and, the, and, and humanity. They are in this one, uh, they're in a one individual existence. Uh, it's not a new person. It's not a new existence. Um, and uh, they're fully God, fully human. Uh, and, and this will also be codified later on in 20 years in, in Chalcedon uh, fully, uh, but, but they're perfectly divine, perfectly human, and, and uh, they, they're two complete natures uh, and distinct natures in one, uh, just as you, you, your body and soul are two different things, but they make up who you, uh, you know, this one uh, within you, uh, but it's still you. Uh, it's not a new, a new creation. So Jesus wasn't this new hybrid human uh, or hybrid God, you know, a demigod or something like that. Um, and, and so this is what kind of comes out of it. And this, and this also had been spoken of uh, previously uh, um, that was starting to be fleshed out. The, the, the kind of the gems uh, of this were, and the seeds were planted with, with Ignatius uh, of Antioch in, in, in the first century, of course, who knew the the apostles, John at least, and and, and some of these, and and were, were were there with those those followers of Christ was was that first uh, first group of of fathers who came um, after after the apostles um, and, and starts to do that, but then fully this gets fleshed out in, in Ephesus and Chalcedon um, for 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 those reasons. Yeah, and I'm and I think it's important too that as Christians, you know, it's okay if you don't know the terms like hypostatic union and you know it's not <laughs> no it's <laughs> well i mean if you want to be a super christian yeah should, right, but, right if you want to get the second layer of heaven so. <laughs> uh, and you know and that's okay because yeah, as christians you know telling someone hey i believe that you know jesus is true god and true man like that's what that's what he is um but i think what you know some of these more complicated ways of talking about church doctrine are of course because god has created and given us a wide variety of people and some people thirst for that kind of stuff they want all the little details and you know contrary to what you might pick up from watching the news uh christians are not idiots like christianity has produced and continues to produce some of the most intelligent and greatest thinkers well, on I, the planet. Well, I mean, Western civilization owes its existence to Christianity. I mean, the the Enlightenment and the the Renaissance, all of this comes the, out of the scholastics and, and, and the, the bed, you know, the, the groundwork that the church was doing in, in, the, in the so-called Dark Ages. Uh, where, where uh, you know, it really wasn't dark. I mean, there was maybe most of the people didn't uh, weren't learned, but the, the church was, and they they were keeping things alive. They were, and 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 you have these, uh, you know, this growth in those areas. Then then eventually, you know, the devil sees it and says, "Oh, I can I can latch onto this, and and we can we can run with it." And so you, humanism starts to pop up, and and in a more forceful way, and. and and rationalism and, and, and all of these types of, of, of you know, ways of thinking contrary to what Scripture placed before us. Um, so, so we kind of have this Nestorius um, in, in Nestorianism and his, his belief. And like we said previously, uh, the Eutychians then come from this. Eutychius is... Uh, is opposed, extremely opposed to Nestorius, um, and, and wants to fight against what he's saying, um, but he takes it too far. Um, he takes it uh, to the other uh, extreme and says that that the divine and the human natures of Christ are mixed together into a new single kind of hybrid uh, uh, type of person, um, and and this this is not the case either. Um, that is, it's not a new person that is being uh, being created, and and so and by new person meaning not divine in in the sense of being solely divine and not human in being solely human, but some kind of third thing. Yeah, yeah, which is what the the council. Yeah, this is calls it. It, it. Yeah, exactly, and and so 
you know, so well, why is that important? Why, you know, why do we have to, why does it matter if, it, what if he is this, this super, you know, human third kind of, uh, of, of, of being? Um, but when we, when we allow ourselves to, to follow that way of thinking, uh, too often we can go down the, the path of, well, if, if Jesus is this superhuman person, that he wasn't human like I was, like I am, then of course he can be sinless. Of course he can do all the things he did. Um, he doesn't, temptation really wasn't temptation for him. Um, you know, his, his hardships, his, his struggles, his, you know, sweating blood, that, that really wasn't uh, him suffering because he's not like us. He's above that. He's, uh, he has, a, has an advantage over us and it distances us from, from relating to Christ in his humanity. Well, and like, and that ultimately leads to the question that people ask at this time: if you know, if Jesus wasn't fully human like we are, then he didn't redeem humanity. Yeah, exactly. Like he redeemed some kind of superhumanity, and so then where is our hope? You know, if Christ was not also true man, then you know, what died for us, like... <laughs> well, and, and that's what you'll see was, you know, some of the the, the other things that come, heresies that come uh, before and after this, you know, you'll see, well, what did die? Oh, well, you know, just the human died. Or, well, uh, the, the divine left at the, at the last second and didn't die. And, and there's all sorts of twisted ways that we have to, to um, justify these this kind of thinking. Um, and we have to tread lightly in responding to those because we don't want to say more than what Scripture says. Exactly. Because then we run the risk of, you know, getting it wrong on the other side, like, you know, Eutyches did. Yeah, exactly. And, and so he basically comes up with a new <laughs> new uh, uh, heretical sect, uh, the monophysites, um, and and where they have one nature of uh, of Christ. And, and you know, the monophysites are still still here today um they, they don't call them monophysites anymore they call them miaphysites which is mia is just one in greek so it's i don't know why they changed to that it's, it's the, the um <laughs> it's that the that church body that doesn't acknowledge chalcedon right yeah it's it's all the it's all the um a, the coptic yeah. the, the the armenian ethiopian syrian uh, orthodox all those those uh north african mainly north african uh uh Churches uh, still still hold to a monophysite type. Now they say they don't, but uh, they do. <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, they they do. Um, and so this is still around today. Um, in 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 you know maybe not these may not be mainstream churches that you've you've heard of, but in parts of the world they're I mean they're the church. And yeah. and and I and it, you know. It's hard because, you know, with the Coptic Church, you see the persecution that they went through in Egypt, um, in, in Iraq, and and in, in the Middle East when when they're they're being wiped out for their their faith in, in Christ, um, and so they're they're, they're being martyred uh, for in, in faith, but they also are um, they have a, a wrong doctrine, which is which is unfortunate and, and sad that that that's that they don't have the assurance that that is there. Um, or, or, you know, anything that takes us from Christ, takes us away from Christ, uh, is, is not a good thing. And the further we get from him, the easier it is for us to, to, uh, to fall away in, in hardship. But to, to the Coptic's credit, <laughs> you know, there's not a whole lot of American martyrs right now. Um, there, there are true martyrs in other parts of the world, and, and a lot of them happen to be these... these uh, you know, like I say, the Coptics and, and, and those that are being persecuted in these, these Middle Eastern uh, Islamic countries. This is Principal Kate Telke from Our Savior Lutheran School in Houston, Texas. At Our Savior, it is our mission to serve families for Jesus Christ. We also take pride in our provision of a classical Lutheran education for the nearby areas of Inwood, Garden Oaks, Oak Forest, and the Heights communities. 
As a classical Lutheran school, we provide an excellent education for all children. Classical education is a beautiful, tried and true teaching model that allows our teachers to instruct all children, regardless of their abilities. Our Savior does not exist to simply provide our students with the skills they need for the next level or the ability to score high in standardized tests. We provide an education that is centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we seek to cultivate wisdom and virtue by nourishing the soul on that which is true, good, and beautiful. We are teaching our students how to think and how to express themselves eloquently. OSL is a loving community where our children grow and learn to live in the grace of Christ each day. God has blessed us with a beautiful 60-acre campus that allows us to see the beauty of His creation on a daily basis. We welcome you to join us for a personal tour and pray that we may serve your family. Contact us at www.oslschool.org. You may call us at 713-290-8277 and follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Again, that website is www.oslschool.org. And so I think so far we've kind of looked at, um, we've got a lot of issues in the, ch- in the early church with these arguments about um, what is the humanity side of, of Christ. Um, we also have ones that focus on sort of the divine side and one that, you know, uh, Pastor Greg has already mentioned, this docetism. Docetism uh, comes pretty early, and it's this uh, belief that... Um, it's very Greek and very cultural and that you can't mix sort of this physical and the spiritual. We see lots of it, um, even in scripture. Um, it is connected to what emerges as, as a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism essentially would not hold to this idea that the flesh and the spiritual would coexist in, in the way that that we say it does with uh, with Christ. And um, a lot of them, like one of their really popular um, stories was that as Jesus went to the cross uh, to be crucified, um, he ends up switching bodies with uh, Simon of Cyrene, who helps him carry the cross. And so Simon ultimately is crucified on the cross, and Jesus is not, because he's a spirit, and so therefore he can change form. Uh, he just merely takes the look of a human but he's not an actual human um which as christians we would argue well if there was nothing human about jesus well then how is (laughs) how is humanity redeemed at all well Um, yeah exactly and so you you have these these early gnostics uh you know serentius in in the first you know 100 a.d around around that that time um he he becomes what is known as a, 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 a what, what's the word a heresiarch, um, which is the originator of a heresy. So he gets this super title of super heretic. <laughs> That's kind of a cool title. <laughs> and so uh, and so you know he, he teaches that uh, you know that, like you said Christ just just descends upon Jesus at his baptism. Um, so when when the dove descends, you know, in, 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 in Jesus' baptism, at that point, he was just Jesus the man. Uh, but now all of a sudden, he's got Jesus with the divine dwelling in him. Yeah, and that uh, spins off a whole uh, heresy we call adoptionism. Yeah. Where Jesus isn't born God, but rather adopted later yeah. to be well, God. Well, the, the Ebionites, that's the, the whole Ebionite yeah. heresy is, is that. And it's it, it all comes from from this idea uh, that that he was just a man that God took over, almost a possession type of, of thing. Uh, and so, uh, well, you know, but we ask, once again, we have to ask, well, why is this important? Um, did, would it matter if that's what it really, the way it really was? But when, when we do things like that and we, we, we have this way of thing, thinking, um, you have a God that um, basically abandons us 
at, at the last, at the most crit critical moment, um, at the point of death when when he's going to, you know, uh, the Bible teaches and says that Christ took on the sins of humanity and paid for them um, and died for them. And so at the last last critical moment when he's going to die, uh, he says. No, um, Jesus is going to die. The man Jesus, or Simon Asiri, is going to die, or, or whatever it is. And so he abandons us in a most critical moment, and, and that's that's not a God you you can have faith in. One that that, that is just you know, uh, like I say, is just going to turn it turn in turn the other way, and and when we need him the most, and so we we, we don't have that assurance if, if this is the thought we have, and this is. And this is kind of the thinking that, that the Gnostics had as well, that this idea that, that the flesh was so corrupted, that God, and, and they're not, and for the Christian Gnostics and the ones that come out of this, it's not a disrespect for God. Um, they're, they're trying to hold him in, in such a high regard that they say, well, the, the human soul of, of Christ could not, uh, you know, would be corrupted. The, the soul of Christ would be corrupted by uh, sin. Uh, that the sin is so powerful that that it would be um, would overtake it, and so therefore, uh, this this human soul had to be replaced by a divine soul. Um, and that's what we, we get out of Saturnarius of Antioch, which kind of basically says that. <laughs> well, and I mean, and when you look at this, what you've got, you, you know, sort of consistent with all of these heresies is you have. Uh, people who are concerned about trying to adequately explain things about God, but their primary, you know, method of interpretation is their own culture. Their primary method of explanation is um, their own, you know, sort of human logic and fallen human wisdom. Um, they're not, you know, placing the the emphasis back on Scripture and what has been revealed, but rather this is how we can interpret it based on what we know um, outside of scripture. And, you know, and I think that's a consistent warning for us as Christians today. You know, if, if you interpret everything you believe with, you know, your politics or your culture or, you know, your whatever modern understanding of whatever, um, you know, well, what role does scripture play then in your faith? Like what role does God's word play in well, I mean, your and, understanding and what of happens is it, scripture becomes, you know, a, a resource just for proof texting. So I, I, I'm going to I need to have five the five five points of scripture that that, that prove my point, um, and then ignore the whole revelation in, uh, of scripture, and, and I'm going to base everything on one or two two verses. Yeah, and like like we were saying before, you know, when we look at scripture, scripture isn't a collection of sayings that you grab out, you know, pithy quotes to defend something you're doing but rather it's this interwoven I've been using it wrong this whole time <laughs> yeah i know this is actually a commentary on your most recent sermon um this is uh you know it's this collection it's it's not a collection of of, of sayings it's you know this intertwined word of god where you know you begin to just pick stuff out and ignore other stuff and it unravels and you don't have god's word anymore you don't have scripture you have something that you've created based on a culture, a cultural element that you're using as your primary source. Yeah, and, and I mean, and there's this 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 idea that and they've uh, it's been you know around for a long time. It says that you know that, that, that Christ is that that golden thread that that, that weaves in and out uh, throughout the pages of the Bible. But I, I've never liked that saying uh, because because it, it in my mind it's this picture of well, there's this thread that's weaving in and out of the, the pages. So some parts of it is, and some parts it isn't. Uh, about Jesus, but it, it's all about Jesus. I mean, from Genesis to, to Revelation, it's all about Christ. Uh, we have at the very beginning uh, the perfection that God created for us in that garden paradise. We have in three chapters in how we screwed it up, and then everything else after that's the commentary on how Christ is, uh, you know, God fulfilled his promise uh, to Eve and to mankind that, the, 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 you know, the, the child uh, would, would, you know, destroy the serpent. Well, and um, and then when you look at um, when you when you when you understand that that Christ is you know kind of is interwoven throughout Old and New Testament, then you look at some of these early heresies where that doesn't fit with 
their ideas about you know how they're looking at the scripture and so we get these heresies that want to eliminate the old testament or they want to you know or they split it into old testament is this kind of god and new testament is this kind of god and that's you know a, a misunderstanding of what we would call long gospels a misunderstanding of uh this sort of connectivity of, of scripture this is why oftentimes you'll hear people who don't know the scripture very well um talking to christians who also don't know their scripture very well <laughs> and they'll say well do you know the scripture contradicts itself because of this or that and a christian who is not maintaining himself or herself in the word will say oh you know i never even thought about that like oh that does sound like a contradiction yeah. and you know that that's fixed by, by you know, knowing the Bible, reading, <laughs> <laughs> or at least, you know, connecting yourself to someone who will read it for you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, just, uh, but yeah, so, so we have, you know, with the Docetus, these, uh, you know, like I say, Saturnarius, uh, he, he says that he's a, he's a Gnostic. He's, uh, taught that the, the Christ was, was simply an apparition. Um, he wasn't even a man. It was just, he took the form of a man. And then later on, uh, a few centuries later, Apollinarius, uh, also a bishop, kind of goes down this uh, this path as well. But but he basically says that Jesus didn't have the human soul; that it was the uh, the divine logos which uh, took the place of Jesus' soul in him. Because uh, you know, like I said, he he had. It wasn't like he was this guy that, that hated Jesus or hated the church. He was a bishop in the church, um, but he was trying to explain uh, this in a way that made sense to him. Uh, but unfortunately, he was so wrapped up in Gnosticism, he didn't even really recognize it. And and that's what's scary about a lot of Christians today, because this, this I see this very heavily influence a lot of Christians um, uh, in, in in our world today, and you're like, well, where do we see this type of this idea? Well, when when we when we emphasize the spiritual over the the physical, um, to to the the, the, the Christ, you know, and, and, and the actual word, the physical word that we're, we've been given uh, now preserved to us in, in the Bible, is not as important as the emotion, as the spiritual. Uh, aspect of, of me and feeling uh, Jesus, and and, and so uh, we we have a, an emphasis on the feeling of the Spirit as opposed to the understanding of what the Word actually does for us, and so it becomes uh, uh, your faith becomes a testimony of your faith is 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 the intensity of your faith as opposed to the object of your faith, um, and and we see that in in a. A lot of our you know, charismatic churches, uh, a lot of even our, um, not, not necessarily charismatic, but our, our uh, Baptist theology churches, the, the, the non-denom churches that have this type of, of emotion-driven services, um, because, because it's, it's all about the, the emotion and the feeling and, and the spirit. Um, well, and um, just to bring it back to, to demonstrating how like I'm correct, um, that's essentially just the, what we've been talking about it, uh, culturally. Like we believe that our feelings are important. Um, you know, we believe that. You know, and even for the people who will say stuff like, "Oh, you know, I don't care about your feelings." Like, yeah, you do. Like <laughs> you're you're expressing right now by saying about how much you caring about it. Like you like you had to go out of your way to say it because you care about it. Like you you have this strong feeling. Like we're emotional creatures. Um, and when that, when wanting to satisfy that or wanting to see that somehow in our faith in an, you know, an equal measure, um, you know, not that you're not going to have emotional experiences in your faith. Of course we are because we're human beings, but when that becomes your primary thing, well, then now you've used your culture as a way to interpret scripture rather than allowing scripture to guide you in your culture. And, you know, you end up with another heresy. Yeah, uh, without a doubt, and, and so and, that, and that's what we I think we might have mentioned this before, but you know the, the devil is not that creative. He does the same things over and over. Because, and that's because we're idiots. Yeah, because it works. <laughs> it's like it's like we we are not very smart because we keep falling for this. Like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football over and over again. That's that's who we are, and and we just uh, we don't recognize it and because one we we believe we're smarter than that, and that we don't need to 
study the word, that we don't need to, to be, uh, you know, constantly learning and immersed in God's word. We think, well, you know, I went through confirmation, I'm good. Or I, you know, I, I went last week to church. I don't need to go for another two months or, or whatever. Or, you know, I, I, I listen to, uh, you know, Christian radio when I'm going to work. So it's like, well, that's... I mean, you should still listen to podcasts, though. Yes, exactly. Obviously <laughs> that, uh, this one in particular. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we, we find all these other excuses as opposed to actually being in God's word um, and, and being surrounded by people of faith who are also in God's word and who are at a a church that has sound doctrine, that has, uh, you know, faithful pastors that have gone to faithful seminaries that have faithful professors that have have learned uh, from the mistakes of the past and, and recognize how, or at least try to instill the ways in, in, in to the pastors, how to recognize those heresies and, and not repeat them. Um, and how to instill the truth into the parishioners. Um, I mean, that's what we're doing with Carl now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a long, long journey, guys. Um, but yeah, that's true. <laughs> but isn't it for all of us? <laughs> uh, and, and that's the point, though. It, it's never over. Um, you know, all, all kidding aside, it, none of us are perfected Christians, and, and none of us ever will be until Christ comes back for, and, and calls us home. Um, and so we, we live in this this state of, of sinner and saint, uh, where we we constantly trip and fall and, and over ourselves and in our own uh, beliefs, and and Christ continuously is is there to offer forgiveness for us and for those those wrong beliefs that we we espouse when we repent of them. So. True God and true man. Yeah, is, that's the uh, is the easiest way to explain it. Yeah, so we could have just said true God, true man, and we'll see you next week. Uh, but well, actually, not next. Well, week. I guess yeah, whatever, whatever we do, another one of these. Uh, but but I did, uh, you know. So we're kind of wrapping up for for this episode. Uh, we we looked at these different heresies, how they can go one way or the other, how they can, uh, but all of them ultimately take the focus off of Christ. They take the focus off uh, who He is. And put it on on our own understanding, our own reasoning, uh, which is which is always deficient. Um, so for future uh, episodes, we've got a few ideas. We will most probably be doing a Christmas themed one as we get closer to Christmas next month. Um, but we have some ideas for some future podcast episodes. But we'd also like to hear from some of you of ideas that you might be interested in hearing us talk about. And uh, you can email those to in the land of us podcast, all one word in the land of us podcast at gmail dot com. And if as long as it's not a stupid idea, we'll probably uh, do it. So. Well, most likely we'll do it and just claim credit for it. Um, but. <laughs> but still nonetheless uh, no we'll actually give you credit if, if you uh, do do that uh, if it's good but uh, yeah in the land of us podcast at gmail.com you can also uh, message us on our facebook page at facebook backslash in the land of us um, and so uh, and i mean and not to restrict what your ideas are but you know we'd like this podcast to be focused on this intersection between christianity and culture um, looking at it uh, historically and then also, you know, with today and, and so forth. So, yeah. So if you got any ideas, shoot them over to us and we'll be uh, more than happy to to consider them. And if you already have sent us stuff, um, we haven't really been reading our email, but we will now <laughs> yeah. because we've mentioned down there. <laughs> yeah. Now we have to. We've kind of <laughs> painted ourselves into a corner. Um, but well, uh, I just want to thank everybody once again for joining us in for in the land of us podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kelly Krieg. And I am Dr. Carl Boffman. And we will see you in the future. Yeah. Whenever, whenever you can see if you're just like binging <laughs> these, I mean, we'll probably see you in a few minutes. Yeah. All right. With that, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>